what is it that stops people from achieving their goal the most? But you have to have some understanding of how it all comes together. That's the pinnacle point where people go, okay, do you know what? So how does a qualified barrister end up founding one of the most recognized fitness brands in London? It was a choice. If you wanted something, there was only one way to do it, and that was to go and earn it. And the rest is history. You entered into a prison to help inmates yeah. become personal trainers. Yeah. So many people that are just one stepping stone away from doing something useful with their life. I didn't tell anyone I wasn't a prisoner. I just went in and started going to the gym in there. I was there to run a course, and a course that could change their lives. What was the decision behind buying out your co-founders? Different work ethics. You have a disparity which you just can't reconcile. What was the trigger point for you? Resentment creeps in because one of you is working a lot harder than the other. I never thought I'd do this. What has been the best move that you've made and what has been the worst? Good question. I guess... So, James, there is no doubt that my favourite conversations are always with the people that I've known for years. I don't really know how I've known you for years, but, but maybe the years have just gone by ridiculously quickly. But I definitely have done, because I remember back in the days when you were just starting and building up your following, I was there right at the beginning and have watched your journey grow throughout. So yeah. I'm hoping today it means that I'll be able to reflect on some of those times and you'll yeah. be able to tell us a lot more about them. But the question that I pose to most of my guests at the start of these podcasts is, Many people will be here because they already know roughly what they think you do. Yep. But in your own words, who are you and yeah, what do you do? Good question. So I'm actually called James Exton, but otherwise known as JE Online. Um, and well, I'll tell you what I do. I do a number of different things. So it's not a simple one tick box answer. So um, my main kind of business, if you like, is London Muscle. It's a fitness business, um, doing all things fitness, shock, um, digital training, um, personal training courses, nutrition, supplements, one-to-one -one coaching, you name it, we do it, clothing you know how we do it. So there we go. So that's the main kind of entity, but behind that was a kind of career journey, totally different to fitness, um, a legal background. Um, I originally qualified as a barrister, a criminal barrister. So that was how I started out, if you like my professional life. Um, and I sit here now owning a number of different businesses. I have a business consultancy company with my twin brother, Tom, otherwise known as TGE. Um, so we're split across loads of different things. Um, I've got property. I do um, brand work with different brands, campaigns. So really diverse mixture of um, different entities. But I guess if you were to bring it all into one kind of hub, we do a lot of different things across a lot of areas that a lot of gents your age and my age like. So do you, you said before that the thing that's always been in the background, the main business, LDNM, yep. London Muscle. Yep. However, you've always been, to me, as watching you online as a persona, the king of the side hustle. Yep. Was that the same when you were a kid? Take us right back to where you grew up and what that was like and what you were doing. Yeah, fine. So I've grown up in London all my life. Um, side hustling, I would say, even as a kid before I knew what the word side hustle meant, I was doing it. And I don't know if that's in eight, but it was always born from kind of a real enthusiasm just to make money. And obviously money is a, a scaled um, word, isn't it? From when you're a kid, what money looks like to you might represent itself in a pair of trainers or something really, really quite small to you now, but it's all relative to your age. So as a young kid, um, I was 12, I worked in a paper shop and I was getting a couple of quid and I was like, yes. These are a couple of quid, but the couple of quid added up over weeks would allow me to buy the things that I wanted. And obviously your desires when you're 12 are totally different to a man of my age now. So that made me happy and content at that time. I could buy the things I wanted. And I think aspirations grow the more money you make, your, your horizons widen because you can actually see and you start to enter different elements of life where you can see greater um, possibilities or greater assets or things that you never thought would be a possibility are now slowly becoming a realistic opportunity for you to achieve. Um, so yeah, I've always been a grafter. It doesn't matter what it is, I've turned my hand to it and real bare basic stuff. Um, and I'm a very strong believer that no matter what you do, no matter what it pays, if you put in 100% effort to something, it's always going to elevate you to the top of that game. When you're at the top of that game, it's on to the next and it opens a door. And that's what I did from a paper shop to cleaning, to paper rounds, to retail, to night work, to security shifts, to cleaning bogs, anything. I would always do it and I'd say yes to it. And I also realized that going back to that notion of side hustle, many different streams of income, even as a kid before I understood that proposition was the key. So if I could be cleaning at night or doing security at night in a day job or restocking Abercrombie as it was at the time um, at night and earning, you know, 
decent money overall. Yes, it was a lot of hours. Yes, if you broke it down, how much it was per hour, it wasn't great. But cumulatively, over the course of a whole month, I was content with what I was earning and I could see there was a potential to make a load of money if I put enough hours in. Obviously not sustainable for the whole of your life, but I think when you're young, you have a different uh, ability to work all those hours. And I always used to think the more hours that you worked, the less hours you had to spend. So I saw a massive correlation between earning more and spending less, which ultimately netted me more money in that time frame. So yeah, al always been on a side hustle, always. But it seems like that is quite an open mindset to have from a young age. And yep. most of the population in the UK actually has a fairly closed mindset. Yep. So what I try and look for is triggering moments or reasons why someone would have that open mindset. It could be someone listening, listens to a podcast like this and ends up starting to think about having more of an open mindset about doing something. But what would trigger that at the age of, say, 12? Yeah. So from a young age, it was very much kind of there was nothing available monetary wise. So it was a choice. If you wanted something, there was only one way to do it, and that was to go and earn it. And I think if you've been given things, and there's nothing wrong with being given things, but I think if you don't have a value of money or a concept of money at a young age, it becomes almost kind of like a right. You think, I've got money, so I don't have to go and do these things. There's no necessity to go out and put yourself in those situations or work yourself to the bone. But for me, it was kind of, I, w I have an option here. I either don't achieve what I wanted, and I can't tell you why I like cars or nice clothes or nice trainers at that age, but ultimately it's influence. It's the people you're around. Social media wasn't as big back then, but I think most young lads would probably look at a sports car or supercar and think that's cool. Just, is that genetics? Is that conditioning? I don't know, but we do. We get little toy cars when we're younger. And so for me, it was very much necessity, either go out and achieve it or, or don't bother. And the, the second wasn't an option for me. So what led to becoming a barrister? Was that a career choice based on the fact that you thought that that could earn money? So very funny, actually, and probably not the answer most people listening to this are going to expect. So take me back to my teens, later teens. I found myself wrapped up in all sorts of, of trouble um, on the right side and the wrong side of the law um, for good and for bad, predominantly bad. And I just became fascinated with the law, um, maybe for the reasons of escaping things I was in trouble for, or maybe circumventing or finding loopholes. And in any respect, long story cut short, I, I lived a life that was a little bit naughty for a bit. And I found myself in a situation that I managed to get myself out of using the law. And I just thought, you know what? There's so many people that find themselves in pickles that aren't necessarily bad people, but are just wrapped up with either the wrong people or going down the wrong path to achieve that aspiration we talked of a minute ago, which is ultimately money. And I just thought that this is fascinating as a career. Um, and then it was sort of a passion that I had. And I found the kind of the academic side behind it quite interesting as well, in terms of like what the arguments were for and against certain things or how you could use a certain case previously gone to, to negotiate, you know, for, for a client. So that was it. So it was kind of born, I guess, from a slightly bad place in my life, but underpinning all of that was one key belief. And that was, I didn't want to live a life of stupidity. I wanted to live a successful, fruitful life. I understood that life was stressful if you were looking over your shoulder. I wanted something legitimate, a good career, something that had, you know, a professional backing behind it and longevity. And that's ultimately why I went and did it. And I also knew that in order to qualify as a barrister, I would have to leave London, which is where I grew up. And leaving London for me was the right thing to do. I was caught up in silliness in London and I needed a fresh start. So everything combined made that journey um, what I thought it should be. Uh, and I left for Nottingham University. I never looked around the university. I never viewed anything. I just knew that I had to have a clean break. And one thing I'd say about Tom and myself, we always knew we wanted to achieve and be successful in the right way. And so throughout school, our work ethic, whether it was in a paper shop, whether it was at school, wherever it was, yes, we were naughty. Yes, we misbehaved, but we always did what we needed to do to achieve. So for me, for school, I wouldn't say I'm academic. Naturally, I wouldn't say I'm an academic that sits there and just inhales information and then regurgitates it. I worked my hardest to get the grades that I needed. And I went off to Nottingham with my bags packed and escaped London for four years. And do you think that was the best decision that you made in your youth to get out of London? Because as we know now, if we fast forward, crime is nearly doubling year on year. Yeah. We've just had to spend 10 minutes <laughs> making sure bike. your bike's fine yeah, outside yeah. the front and of the van. And even then it's 50-50. <laughs> down one of the nicest roads I've ever seen. Yeah. But a minute away, it's like a completely different yeah. world. So back then, was it still too naughty to be wrapped up in? Yeah, I just I just think it's so easy for people of any age to get caught up either with the wrong people, go down a path. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um, obviously, there's a huge scale of what people do that's naughty. Some are on different ends of the moral compass. But I think now in this day and age, it's even more so likely that people will get caught up in that because you know, the the demands on you online, on social media, so many people now, when I was that age, I didn't have the pressures. I couldn't see what you were doing. I wouldn't have known you. I couldn't see what all the people my age were achieving 
achieving in quote marks because we know a lot of social media is kind of smoke and mirrors and maybe someone actually is renting a car or is not hasn't bought that house and they're just renting whatever there's a lot of stuff that's um you kind of misleads you but i think for young people there's a huge pressure to live a lifestyle that ultimately does it make you happy 50 50 doesn't necessarily make you happy but i think a lot of people want to live it and think it's the dream um so yeah i think so having said that with that area of oh sorry era of social media there's never been more ways to make money online so there are more opportunities, I think, for young people to go and make a good, honest buck online using socials in whichever way they fancy um, and to ultimately be able to escape that other route that is a possibility for some people. Yeah. So how does a qualified barrister, and somewhere I have seen the photo, and I'm sure if you follow James on socials, <laughs> you've seen it crop up somewhere. Yeah. I can picture it in my head yeah, yeah. with a headband on. And it's such a different looking individual opposite me today. Yeah. So how did that person end up founding one of the most recognised fitness brands in London? Yeah. So, you know, look, I, I did the bar, qualified as a barrister, got called to the bar, was one of the, the youngest people, got a scholarship to do so. So I felt really kind of empowered by that journey. And it was something that I'm still very passionate about now. And I'm sure we'll touch on the work I still do in the kind of um, rehabilitation world. Fitness business, I started being a barrister in crime. It's government funded, as usual with most things, governments, they're huge cuts. Um, so legal aid um, is poorly funded. It, it's it's not a glamorous career from a monetary perspective, but I really enjoyed being a criminal barrister in terms of the type of work, the people you met and the sort of adrenaline you got out of different scenarios you found yourself in, whether you're below a courtroom with a, with a prisoner or you're in a prison or whatever it happens to be, police station. So I enjoyed that side of it, but money wasn't great. And you're running around. It's not a social career. If you get a brief on a Friday, you are working all weekend on it. No two ways if you're in court on Monday. There's no uh, boundaries with working hours at all. Um, you're self-employed technically. So all your benefits in terms of pension and what have you aren't there. So from a kind of commercial side, it's not glam. And I started the fitness blog, if you like, back in 2012. It was born out of a hobby with my twin brother and two other guys. Um, and that was ultimately a passion, but not necessarily a commercial venture. And as far as you kind of fast forward the clock, it became something that was known online and social media. And it was something we thought we can't continue to do this without monetizing it. It's taking up too much of our time, too much of our resources. We're trying to juggle too many things and we can't give, give people stuff infinitely for free. It's just not going to work. Either that stops or we have to charge or we continue it as a business. So the transition was um, I wouldn't say it was an on off switch, but it was very much the bar was great. I enjoyed it. I was interested in the work. I had a passion sat here that was starting to monetize as a side hustle on the side. And in the first year made considerable amounts of money. And then I was looking at the two thinking there has to be a leap. There has to be a point at which you go from A to B and take that. You can't balance the two indefinitely together. In the middle of that, if you like, the conjoining thing was that my father, um, got cancer, was diagnosed with cancer, and I became a carer in that kind of transition period. So I left the law firm, not permanently, but temporarily to look after my dad. And in that time, I was able to do all the stuff for the fitness business online, whereas the legal work required me to be physically present. So I started to transition my workload, if you like, during that time and channel energy into it, then at a time where that was really kind of an escape route for me. When that ran its course and, and I lost my father, then I had a kind of easier choice to make because the fitness business had gone progressively forward. And I kind of was at a point where I needed to resolve certain things and make sure my family was okay. So at that point, there was a clearer decision to make. And I took the leap of faith and go back to the law firm and continued with London Muscle. And um, cliche as it is to sound, the rest is history in, in, in terms of that. That is quite a quite a lot that's happened in a short space yeah, of time. it's crazy. I got but, shingles <laughs> on top of everything. It was crazy. Well, a question that's come into mind is how did you end up with such a passion for a gym? for the gym and yeah. a fitness blog. Why, why was fitness and your your fitness yourself so important to you? Yeah. Was it wrapped up in the fact that, as you said, as a young male online, Instagram come about, yeah. we, we like to see cars, we like to see nice houses, people aspire for more, but they also start to see bodies and yes. shapes and then yeah. want to aspire for that, which is why a digital business selling guides can do so well online as well. But what was the trigger point for you? Yeah, I guess, hands up, I'm not going to lie, it's vanity at the beginning. It was a, it was a confidence thing. I thought, do you know what, as a bloke, yeah, we can do our hair, we can do our beard or whatever. But I thought if I can get in shape, that was kind of a vanity, a confidence thing. And I thought it, it was, it was, I saw images. That I thought that's what I want to look like, you know? And so I started at uni. Obviously uni is a pinnacle time really where you're trying to find your feet and you're trying to be someone, whoever that may be. So for me, it went hand in hand. And then as time went on, 
I realised its benefits in terms of doing a law degree was extremely stressful, a lot of hours and commitment sports and, and things like that were sort of a no-no. I couldn't really commit to sports with the amount of study I had to do. So the gym became something that was so flexible I could do in my own time, but I started to see the stress relief benefits. And I was like, if I can find 30 or 45 minutes for myself each day during a time of extreme stress, whatever it is, then I'm onto a winner here. And, and the same when I lost my father, that was my escape. That was my channel, my anger, channel, my emotions, ch channel everything and leave whatever it is alone for 45 minutes, clear my brain. And just, I used to put myself through, you know, a lot of physical exertion, I guess, as, as an escape route. And to this day, it's still for me, something that, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've never suffered or never felt that I've suffered with mental health or all these kind of elements that our modern age is suffering with more and more. But I've always been consistent with this. This is my escape. This is my time. This is something for me to, to to improve myself. And I've always felt myself more productive by doing it. So it went from kind of the young James, if you like, vanity led, not really appreciating the additional benefits. And then when I started to see the additional benefits and how it allowed me to go through roller coaster periods in my life and not hit rock bottom or escape or not get caught up in being just an angry man that was annoyed at the world for what had happened and trauma and what have you. Then I started to think this can help a lot more people. Then other people come in and tell you their story. And then it grew a massive community, the LDM community of people that are like-minded. And, you know, a lot of people will do it not necessarily because they want to look a certain way, but they know that if they don't do it, it's like stopping medication for some people. They'll feel that they regress mentally um, and they feel the endorphins from it. And ultimately, I don't want to drop dead. <laughs> Which is a huge problem because obesity is absolutely yeah, crazy exactly. at the minute. And, and, and people do suffer from various health conditions linked to it. So, Were your parents entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial or is that flair come from somewhere completely else? It's very interesting. So I say my dad lived a more conventional, like nine to five, if you like, um, job. My mum is entrepreneurial, but not in the sense of creating, you know, a multi-million pound company. This is a lady still now to this day that trades on market stalls. She'll take this, wow. buy off you for a quid and punt it out for 250. So she's a hustler. She's the, she's the queen of side hustles. She will punt anything out. She'll sell sand to a camel. In so, London. Yeah. Yeah. In and around London. So she's very much across loads of different things and, and not in a negative way. I wouldn't say our idea of entrepreneurs probably wrapped up with someone who's monumentally financially successful. She just, potters around making a bit of money on bits and bobs. Does that make sense? She's not got a multi-million pound empire behind her, but she just trades different things. And yeah, I would say- Sounds like she's damn good at making money when she yeah, needs to. Yeah, honestly. And, and do you know what? Credit to her because, you know, A, she's not had a mental breakdown with me and my twin brother. So that's the strongest human I've met in my life. And number two, she was the one that got Tom and I side hustling without knowing it because she was actually very calculated in the sense that A, she installed the value of money in us, but B, she was the person that was like, boys, if you want to make money, you've got to go and make money. And that was what was installed in her as a kid. You're not getting it. So tough, whatever. She'd put clothes on our back and food on our plate, but anything you wanted clothes wise that wasn't the bare basics, I had a brand attached to it or was more expensive, whether it's football boots at school, whatever it is. She was like, look, you can have 10 quid for your boots because that's what they are in Tesco or Asda. If you want whatever it is, the Adidas Predators or whatever they were at the time, you've got to chip in and put the other 70, 90 quid to it or you're not getting them. So that was the best thing that was ever installed in me. And, you know, she would go to markets or cash and carries and buy us multi-packs of sweets. We would give her the money. She would buy it because we weren't driving at the time, give us the stock. And then we'd be sent out almost, <laughs> almost like workers, both of us to school, flog it all and we keep the profit. So you don't think about it at the time. You just thought, yeah, this is cool. Making a bit of money and stuff, but she, yeah, she's the side hustle queen. Those are the skills that come through to what you're doing now. The, exactly the same, same exactly principle, the same skills. Cause we'll come on to when I spoke to you before at different times, you're very good at when others just kind of cope with the fact their business has peaks and troughs throughout, throughout mm. the year. Every trough, you seem to just plug it with something to bring it back up yeah. to the set, to the yeah. same level. We're going to how that, that works. But when you've, started going full-time with London Muscle. Yeah. You said you made a pretty a good amount of money in mm. the first year, which was kind of a wake-up call. Yeah. Like, wow, we should we should really do this. And that was because of the cutting guide. Yeah, the, so these are still this on the table sort of today. We've got here. So these are, they're digital training guides, but every customer gets sent a heart so sent a hard copy too so they can track their workouts in the gym and they've got something tangible they don't want to be on their phone uh, in the gym so yeah that that was the starting point for the business digital training which at the time back in 2012 was quite novel everyone was sort of either PT or nothing else really so digital training something to follow some structure guidance and support from us guys as well around it and then today we still got obviously our training programs just dropped uh, the new 2024 ones in Jan and then I couple that with my own one-to-one -one coaching so I have my own clients who have completely bespoke coaching with me 
check in with me every single week, completely accountable. Um, I fit it around every single component of their life, whether it's family, whether it's work, whether it's social events. And yeah, one to one coach um, a number of people across various different disciplines now as well um, in fitness, but also mentorship as well. How did you deal when you first actually started to make your first good amount of money? with, as you mentioned, a kind of real mixed background from on one yeah. side being really on the right-hand side of the law, literally with yeah. the hat on, to the other side not being. What was that like getting your first wake-up call that you'd earned some good money? And how did you, what did you do with it? Yeah, really interesting. I think because of my grounding, a pound coin to me at the point that I was making tens of thousands of pound coins versus the couple of pounds in the paper shop, the value of those pound coins remain the same. So while some people may not have the concept of the value of money, both me and my brother were sensible. We didn't go and just waste it hand over fist because we knew what that meant to us. And even if it was, we still had more disposable, we were still reluctant to just go and waste it on the things that, you know, there were certain luxuries you might buy, but we still quantified everything and looked at something and thought that's a complete ripoff. Well, that's a complete waste of money or a thousand quid on a pair of trainers. I'm going to stand in some dog muck or, or walk for a puddle in. And we were very kind of calculated with it. So we didn't do that kind of knee jerk that some people do do. They make it and lose it. We were very much hold on, squirrel, save it like we did when we were in the paper shop to give that example again. And then we started just to build, I guess, a pot of money if you like, which then had us thinking, well, what can we do with it? And before the cars and before everything, my route was property. I was like, I'm going to invest this money um, because I don't want to go and spend it, waste it, and then be left with nothing. So I was always on that cautious back foot. Even though the money was coming in, I was always very much like tomorrow's not promised in terms of business. Like you talked about peaks and troughs. We don't know what's coming around the corner. So let's get ourselves that solid, strong foundation. Let's not worry about what other people think if I'm balling or successful. I couldn't care less what people think about me. Then when the time's right and I've got my foundations, then I don't feel uncomfortable in a supercar. Because if I'm driving a supercar living in my mum's front room, I don't feel like I've made life. That's not how me life is. Life should be something where you've got those strong foundations and the luxuries are luxuries on top of the necessities. So both of us stay grounded in that sense. And to this day, I'm grateful that I did because life isn't linear and it isn't constant growth, growth, growth. Anyone watching this that's a business owner will know that. Yeah, you see people that sold their business for multi-millions and, 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 and won, but most business owners will show you the goods and they won't necessarily talk about the bads. So what were the bads at the start? So I guess with the fitness business, we had linear like or, or just progressive growth for the first four or five years. No, I think this, the first year we did nearly quarter of a million. So it was a very, very strong first period. But as that market- And that's with not a lot of overheads, I'll add to that as well. to start, yeah, yeah working exactly. from home. So yeah. But as time went on, obviously that marketplace became more saturated and that's not a cop-out excuse, but more people entered that market. It became more of a common, people saw that making digital training programs can make su substantial cash. And whilst we had a strong market share, naturally, even if 10 businesses entered in the year and obviously more did than that and made- 30 grand. That's 300k off our top line. So time went on and we were like, we're starting to get cannibalized in the sense that, you know, more and more people are sort of pinching from our, what was our previous pot of money. Um, so I guess from that to see slowed, slowed growth. And then I bought out my business partners in well, whatever COVID was two and a bit years ago. Um, and obviously that used up a sizable amount of cash. And at a time where people thought online fitness was booming, but it wasn't because so much content was free. Because if you paid for a gym membership, your gym would give you online classes because they wanted you to carry on your monthly subscription. And there was so much stuff being done for the good of mental health and, and people, myself included, doing free workouts on Instagram every single day of lockdown. And people didn't really want to dip in their pocket. They didn't know what was around the corner. So although it looked like a booming time for fitness, it was. But from a commercial perspective, it really wasn't. So coupled with that, buying my business partners, expenditure on that, slowdown in revenue coming in, that's starting to be a trough. And you're starting to think, this is something I've never experienced in my life in terms of the downturn of the business, but we're also in a, in a climate which no humans experienced in their lifetime. We've never had a lockdown. We've never had COVID. We've never had this mass disease that's starting to just what on earth around the corner. So I think for times like that, you're kind of thinking, what's going to happen here? Yeah. And to me, I don't see things in life as a trough. And I would say, this is one thing I would say, I don't see things in life other than death, serious illness or serious trauma as a trough anymore. If money slows down in my pocket, I'll get out, I could get out of bed the next day and be like, it's money. If I get out of my bed on my own two feet and I'm breathing, the people I care about around me are alive. I'm cool. I'm genuinely content. If you go and take my cars out of my car park and leave me with my health and the people I love, couldn't care less. And do you think that comes from a humble upbringing? 
It comes from a grounded upbringing and it comes from staring death in the face. Yeah. But there's been many people that alongside the work that you actually do um, with your businesses, there's many people that haven't had a humble upbringing. Yeah. And you entered and I watched this whole process. It's been really good over the years, how you've documented a lot of the stuff that you've done on your social media, particularly Mm -hmm. Instagram. Um, You entered into a prison essentially or yep. into prisons yep. to help inmates yep. become personal trainers. Yeah. How the hell did you have that idea and why? Yeah. So obviously I left the bar criminal uh, background and I thought I was that kid that could have, should have, maybe would have ended up behind that through no fault of my parenting upbringing. I had, I had the stuff that a lot of people would crave to have in my life. I had two parents, I had a roof over my house, I had safety, I had all those things. Yeah. I was still that naughty idiot caught up in silliness. So with that and and the people I met along my journey at the bar, I thought, do you know what? There's so many people that are just, just one stepping stone away from doing something useful with their life. They're not bad. They're actually highly intellectual and just need the right guidance. Or having grown up in London, a lot of the guys I, I got caught up with, they just grew up in the wrong area. And you and I could walk out of our front doors and go to school. And it was an easy choice, but we weren't surrounded by older gentlemen that kind of were running drugs lines or gangs and were putting pressure on you and became a father figure suddenly and the person that gave you the things you wanted in your life and kind of pulled you into this way of life at an age where you probably didn't even appreciate what was going on. And so one of the guys that came on one of our personal training courses up in London was a prison officer and I got talking to him and and he was really passionate about what he did. And he was there not to be a prison officer so much, but more to change people's lives. And I said, look, I did this career. I loved it. I want to help people. Let me in, in in a simple sense. And yeah, he got me a visiting pass and I went in and I didn't tell anyone I wasn't a prisoner. I just went in and started going to the gym in there as almost like a social experiment to see if people would would have any kind of synergy with me or talk to me. And I was in a young offenders, so gentlemen around 18. So I was a bit older and I wore some nice clothes in and trainers which stood out in there just as a sort of, not an experiment, but more just to capture the attention of the aspirational people or get conversation talking. Long story cut short, I started to engage and help people with their training. And then it kind of came out that actually I was there to run a course and a course that could change their lives. And I wasn't staff and I wasn't a prison officer. I wasn't someone that they needed to worry about being, um, you know, not confidential with, or they couldn't tell me what was going on in their life or certain things they didn't want to say. And I became someone that was a third party that was genuinely vest- invested in their their sort of progression. And as time went on, I started to run the courses and they never had anyone, actually, they could run the courses in there for the last 10 years. They've had the ability to, they've never had anyone A, complete it successfully or B, go into full-time employment. And I said, look, do you know what? Money where my mouth is. I'm not going to charge a penny. I don't want to bean out of this. I'm going to take someone from the cells to the city. That's my game plan. I'm going to take one of these gentlemen. I'm going to prove myself for my self-worth. I'm going to show you what I can achieve. And I took the first gentleman, um, hopefully he's watching this. If he's not, I'll send him a link, Jamal. Uh, we sat down, we had a chat and he was in there and he won't mind me saying for class A drug offences. So he'd, he'd been trying to make money. He didn't have an extensive criminal record for anything else. Most viewers will have their own moral compass. But for me, yes, I appreciate drug de- dealing has a knock on negativity for society and it's not ideal. But as a buyer and as a seller and as a profit margin, and in my eyes, I saw him as a businessman. I saw him as someone that had the potential, the work ethic, he'd work through the night. He would be selling people drugs all through the night and I don't glamorize it and I don't agree with it. But what I saw were cross transferable skills. Someone that was dedicated, wanted money. Why was he doing it? He wanted the trainers. He wanted the car. Well, I was that young boy a few years ago. I was the guy that wanted the trainers in the car. We're not two different people, totally different background, totally different ethnicity, totally different everything about us, but united by that same passion money making. And I could see myself in him. Anyway, long story cut short, he then went on to run a team of 24 people up in Canary Wharf in third space, one of London's most prestigious gyms. He got in there. I wrote him mitigating letters because of his criminal record. They wouldn't normally formally take someone on. They'd done what he did. And that was the proof that actually, do you know what? I'm not a magician, but I have social media. I have credibility that I've built over time. And rather than just putting up stories and boasting about what I've got and driving silly cars around, I can change someone's life. And I can sit here in this podcast and tell you now, there's happiness and there's fulfillment. That's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. And have you still got great contact with Great contacts. I've got a group of, I could fill your bus now with 20, 30 men and we could sit and we could talk. And that's, to me, that's something that I can say is genuine fulfillment. It doesn't have a monetary value attached to it. I couldn't care less. But it's something that I'm like, through what I've achieved, I've helped to someone to change their life. He's now at university as well, doing another course. So you know, everyone is capable of change. And I think as time goes on, you you look at what your priorities are. Yes, I like cars and blah, blah, blah. But I, like I said to you earlier, I'd rather do something that makes me genuinely tick 
And I find that that makes me tick. And if you think about it, before I went to the bar, I wanted to help people. I've gone and done my job now. I help people. My one-to-one coaching and mentorship business consultancy, I help people. And I feel like life is a balancing act. Yes, money can make you happier. It's not the decisive factor, but it can. But I would say there's a common theme. All the people I help, if they feel better in the way they look, they're healthier, they're fitter, and they're more successful in their life, we have someone that's balanced. We have someone that's genuinely happy. And I've got a lot of clients that have got more money than most people watching this would care to have. They're not happy because they're either obese or they don't have a balance at home or they don't have any time to themselves, you know? So I think once you, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's an age thing, maybe it's a lived experience thing, but I think it's very important, anyone watching this, by all means chase money, but don't ever lose sight of what actually matters in your life. Because if you do, you'll have money beyond be unhappy and you couldn't give me enough money to be unhappy. But cars also have been a big part of your journey going yeah. along. As much as we can write them off, they were the thing that captivated you when you were young, as you said. It gave you something to aim 100%. for, gave you a stop. And I've seen you in many, many things over yeah. the years. I think the one that I was like, oh yeah, you've done it there, was a yellow event. Was that you? No, it was red, Rossa Beer. Yes, red event to yeah. SV. Your brother yeah. had the yellow event yeah, to yeah, SV. Yeah. And now I would say, have you got a black 991.2 GT3? Good memory. Yeah, which GT3. is very cool yeah, yeah. as well. And I can't even keep up. I actually think you're probably one of the only people that has come into this van that trades cars faster <laughs> than either a car dealer that sits opposite me, like D-Mart, or, yeah. or myself included. Yeah, That's yeah. probably like a year here and there. I've yeah. seen you have things for like three months three and months, they're just fucking months. gone. Yeah. So how has that been? And did that actually feel as good as you thought it was when you finally got into those motors? Yeah. So, I mean, like, uh, like I've said about the car thing, although as much as I'm saying it doesn't bring happiness, it's always been that driving factor. I've always kind of quantified work and success by what I can buy car wise. And that's from being a kid. And do you know what? The first car I bought was with my twin. We bought a 400 pound Renault Clio and that felt amazing because at the time context, and everything's relative. We were like, yes, our first car, an H Reg, 1989, I think it was, 89,000 miles on the clock, horrendous oversized alloys that rubbed the arch, a boom box, whatever you want to call it, subwoofer in the back that made the car rattle with an inch of its life. But that was genuinely like, I got that feeling of like, yes. Then as time went on, and I give you a little kind of a synopsis, I guess, of cars, I, I've had so many things, so many cars are ridiculous. Yeah, but even just, do you know what? The, the incremental stages before we get to supercars, I enjoyed each of those stages at the time because it was that journey as like a rung on the ladder, almost as much, which sounds ludicrous. So going from the h Reg Clio to a Saxo VTR, that jump there to me was the same as going from a 911 to my Hurricane, if you like. So it was still, at the time, I still got that same buzz of kind of like I've achieved. So yeah, well, uh, Clio, um, what did I go? I went, Clio VTR, then I bought a Megane 225 Cup. Do you know the ones with the twin exhaust? Is that the one that you had? Yeah, it's, it's the um, R26 one. Yeah, it? Those. yeah, and that just kept going bang. And then I had to get salty with the dealer because he wouldn't give me money back. And then I got a Focus ST 2.5. Love that Asbro wagon, manual. I'd still have one today, loved it. Then I bought a Volvo T5. I saw all the police cars where I was at Nottingham pinging around these Volvos and they were rapid. Look them up and there's a T5 engine. Anyone watching this is into a slightly older car. So I bought a Volvo S60 T5 Saloon. The least likely car for a 19-year-old. Loved it. I think it was about 300 brake the time I finished with it. Enjoyed that. That was chaos. And then, yeah, started to go into, I think I bought an SLK 55 AMG and then started to go into the supercar stuff. And you added context there because you were 19 at that point. Yeah, the Volvo 19, yeah. And I was living in Nottingham and commuting back to London on the weekend. So I wanted a commuter car. Um, what a fabulous car I might have to get one for nostalgia again but then yeah I started to kind of grow in terms of aspirations obviously I always wanted the supercars um, My, I guess my main proper first proper car was a 911 GTS Carrera 4 Agate Grey um, love that car that was my first proper sports car that felt surreal that felt I never thought I'd do this and then I went to the Lambo Hurricane that was my first supercar and I would say that is the one that stands out most because I've done a number of supercars since. But the enjoyment level and the sensation of achievement doesn't continue past that point to me in the same way. Yes, it might be a 488 that was a little bit more money or an SV that's a bit more money. But that high feeling didn't really jump as much. 
in those increments than the moment that went yeah because the hurricane. hurricane was more than just a car it was my first supercar and I'd have done what I wanted to which was buy a supercar which I never thought I'd be able to do once I ticked that box all the others still ticked the box but it wasn't that same energy had you laid those foundations like property like other bits and bobs before that or yes. is that something that you yeah yeah, yeah how do you decide because this is a bit that baffles me a lot is how you do everything else around the main business which yep. is London Muscle some entrepreneurs that I have that are come and sit here say to get the most out of a cloth you have to ring the entire thing yep. where some people will come here and say well I'm just kind of going and you mentioned as you sat down like right ADHD mode yeah, on I'm yeah, ready. Yeah. because I've seen you do so many things property winning touch detail and yes, yeah. funk with the bikes yeah. London Muscle yeah. I could I um, j- cuts in lockdown yeah, I remember yeah. the trimming kit pro cuts yeah like it's like in a way a glamified online digital version of the mum's market store. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, I can see how you put everything together but why do you approach it like that rather than putting full resources into London Muscle yeah so I would say um, I do I work full time on London Muscle and, and during this period up until January to get our digital products ready now each of these digital products are nearly 200 pages long and I've shot every single photo labelled every single photo written every single exercise description every single workout plan it's like a dissertation times two because we've got the female version as well But to me, I'm only satisfied when I'm under pressure. I actually thrive under pressure most. So I'm ringing that to as much as I can, more than a full-time job, but I'm happy to work 70, 80, 90 hour weeks. So I'm I'm happy to run it to to the equivalent of two times speed on WhatsApp voice note. I'm happy to be that person. So it's not so much that some have detriment and don't get my full attention. It's more that I think I cram more into my life than some people might realise is possible, if that makes sense. And I think as time's gone on, the whole side hustle thing, nothing, like I said to you, is promised in terms of economic climate. And although you think you'll always be flavor of the month or someone that's popular, you might not be. You might not be someone, you you, you know, you know it with, with podcasts, algorithms might help or might hinder. You, you It's out of your control, a lot of stuff. So for me, having multiple different businesses running for me is always going to be a sensible option. Something where ideally, even if one is in the trough, it would be... Pr- probability speaking you'd be less likely to have troughs across five businesses and than you would across just one something um, should be in a, in a in a profit across them all what has been the importance of having an actual built personal brand in all that as well because you could yeah. also say that once you get to that point where you buy the hurricane yeah back certainly when i was growing up before i had a license and those were those kind of moments when you were getting into those cars and i followed from a young age i was then like oh that's incredible hit the follow button yep. and back in the days it was a lot easier I think for people to suddenly if they had a car hit that follow button and grow a personal brand really quickly I remember in the days where maybe uh, Tom would, would go with Paul Wallace on the Idiots Go Supercar yeah, shopping yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there would be a higher click through into people that would then be interested in that other person where today there's just so many people so many things yes, going on yeah, yeah. there's only genuine content that gets through but without what you built as a personal brand, showing people your life, inviting people in, how much harder would building all of those businesses have been? Yeah, extremely hard and they would require a different approach. Not to say that you can't do it, but having a personal brand gives you that catalyst to start with. It gives you that credibility, especially like we talked about, if you're in an area of a business, say it's a competition company where there's a lot of, you know, disingenuous companies that may be not legitimate to have an element or kind of bubble wrap around you of credibility and have, also been very loyal to our audiences in fairness over the years we've never there's never been a brand or product or anything i've worked with that i've ever had anything other than genuine um involvement or um good words to say about i could have sold out and done this whole forex route that loads of people do to make a quick buck of being offered money like most people in this field have been offered money to promote certain things i say no to them because i want to preserve my audience a i owe it to them they've helped build me into the person i am today and b because it allows us to launch businesses with a degree of success because people trust what we do and we are genuine characters behind the screen do you get frustrated online you're very much in touch with social media at the minute and one thing that hugely frustrates me is the sale of drop shipping courses online yeah. to people thinking that they can make a quick buck out of something that is more saturated than the, the die than in the my sponge. lake yeah. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's like yeah. it really angers me because i think that it takes vulnerable people and puts them in a position and it also can knock their confidence when they're on when they're on a journey as well and i do think there's a couple of genuine guys dropping around that can help people build yes. stuff um but w- you've never got caught up in that. Everything that you've always built seems to be quite material. There's always yep. a product. There's yep. always a thing. 
out of all of those bits and bobs, what has been the best move that you've made and what has been the worst? Good question. I guess for me, the most sustainable and the long the longevity is the London the London Muscle business just because it's something that doesn't have a shelf date and being healthy, living longer and being fit and being happy will never be not cool or never not be a necessity. Although we have seen a shift to, to promoting different body images, which I don't have a problem with per se, it will always be within someone's interest to, to, to look and feel good about themselves, whatever look good means. So to me, that's the one that's got the, the, the main legs, if you like. Property, best move. Worst move at times where it's stressful. You know, you get a call at three o'clock in the morning, the fire brigade are at your flat. Why? Because you flooded everyone below you, six floors below. L- literally, two, what was it? Monday, I had uh, a tile go on a property yeah. in just the other side of Swindon, water pouring in onto the electrics yeah. unit, yeah. like smoking, people going mad at the house. Like I can completely reflect yeah. on that. And I, would, and I would say property has, from the capital growth, has been the best move. The worst move in terms of some of those stressful moments, albeit isolated, and then overnight interest rates trebling, that's that's a trough. Of course it is. To, to take five mortgages and treble them all, and they're just about wiping their own bottom each month. But overall, net, the idea behind that business was always capital growth anyway. So even if they wipe their bums each month and I don't make a profit for the next year, happy days. I'm, you know, notably up. I've doubled my money across five places in London. So again... I think if you make a calculated decision with things and you look at it for its right length of journey, so for me, properties long term, yeah, then you can actually have a peak and trough in the same thing and a good and bad. They can be double-edged swords. As long as you know what you're in it for and you don't make it. I would say, okay, I say crypto is a is a trough for me. I just had a dabble and I'm one of those people that I don't know what I'm doing with it and I just got caught up in it. I didn't lose a huge amount of money, but I didn't make any money. I did lose a bit. And then I just thought, what are you doing? Why am I getting caught up in this stupidity? I don't have a clue about it. Why have I entered this market? It was during lockdown. And stocks and shares, I bought in IAG, British Airways, and a load of different airlines when I thought they were at trough. I don't know stocks and shares, hence why I don't give information on it. I never did. Even though I invested my own money, I still wouldn't give other people information. Good thing that I didn't. So those kind of things are things I've dabbled with. And I'm not saying it's not a good move, but for goodness sake, don't do it unless you know what you're doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I lost money. Yeah, I could have kept it in there indefinitely, but... I just jumped out. I couldn't be bothered with monitoring it and looking at it every day. So, you know, but they were never core businesses. They were just knee-jerk impulse decisions in an element of money that I could afford to gamble, which I guess ultimately is gambling. And it's not really my style to do that. They were the stupidest decisions I've made. And they weren't proper decisions. They were just kind of like whims, if that makes sense. But from a business decision, I've I've never gone on a business journey and regretted it. Which is quite interesting. I've learned, but I've not regretted why, what was the decision behind buying out your co-founders? Different aspirations, different mindsets, different um, visions, different work ethics. So I'm someone that won't be satisfied unless I know I'm giving it my all. And I also won't be satisfied commercially or academically if I don't feel like I'm achieving something. And achieving something in the fitness business is, yes, transforming lives, but seeing the commercial growth, that, that satisfies my brain. My other business partners were happy to live a very modest life and weren't so fussed about the commercial side. We're happy just to be able to afford to live month to month, which absolutely nothing wrong with at all. But when you've got someone that's willing to work 150% and someone that's willing to work at 40% because that satisfies their financial um, kind of goals, you have a disparity which is, you just can't reconcile. You have resentment creeps in because one of you is working a lot harder than the other then you try and make that accurately reflected by remuneration and what people are getting paid and a lack of understanding about the true value within a business. So for example, give you an example that cropped up within the business. If I put together a digital product, okay, so the cutting guide, for example, right? That's a digital product and to assemble it into a digital product is a skill. It's an IT skill to put the photos into a document and put the text into it. And I respect that skill. It's not my skill set but it has a fee and it has a, a a market value, a market wage. Let's call it a graphic designer. So that is, you know, whatever you want to call it in London, it could be anywhere between an intern. It's quite a simple task. I don't know, start tw- low 20Ks up to mid 30Ks, let's call it. But building London Muscle as a brand and adding value to that to get the custom base in is totally different. And you can't necessarily put a market value on it. But without it, there is no business. And I'll give you an analogy to make that clearer. iPhone. There's iPhone factory workers that assemble the iPhone. But there's Apple as a brand behind it that makes the iPhone the iPhone. So we started to have these conversations around 
because the guide, digital guides might have turned over, you know, well over a quarter of a million quid, the person that put the photos into that thought that they had made the business that money because they put the photos in to make the product come alive. But there's a difference between the value in that and the wage for that and actually what was the bigger picture, which ultimately credit to my twin brother as well, was building the brand. Building London Muscle was the brand that people wanted to buy into. So you started to hit these points of, you know, um, impasses where you couldn't come to it. No one would agree on it and everyone thought they were owed more money than they were. And then when you live in the business working, it's very hard to then try and articulate that without having an argument. So we started to get to these periods of just not agreeing on things monetary wise and certain things being, you know, causing frustrations ultimately affected how the business ran and ultimately affected the success of the business and what we could achieve because we're just in these stupid arguments and people being stubborn and whatever. So it was the right time. And COVID was the right time when it slowed down to get a valuation on the business that was fair. The gents that were involved were happy to leave for an amount of money. And I was happy to take the risk and go it alone. And I felt that I was the guy predominantly with Tom and, and now to this day predominantly me behind the brand, the guy th that was the fitness guy. And so I was happy to take that leap. Does that then put you off with working with people? Are you a lone wolf now? Will you employ people? Yeah, I'm. A, do you know what? I'm a lone wolf in the sense that I live and work on my own a lot, but I have a radar for people that I work with. So I've realised that agencies and a lot of the agencies I've worked with are big corporations. The service I've got, rubbish, just given an intern on the sly that sat in their room getting paid nothing and they're just charging a fortune in the middle. So I'm very much about finding people with like-minded mindsets and I think that's the most important thing. Is it someone that if I work with them, yes, they get paid what's fair, but if I offer them something that allows them to earn more, i.e. they're jointly invested in the success of this business or product or launch or whatever it happens to be and they bite my hand off of that opportunity and say, yeah, I'll do that. And they're happy to put an extra effort knowing they'll be rewarded for it. That's my kind of person. That is my person. If they just want their... X amount of money per month, irrespective of success. That's not my kind of person because I have a vested interest. And I think business operates in this day and age, the digital stuff where, you know, if, if you can't contact someone after 5 p.m. or on a weekend or they're not invested in the, you know, something like a launch of this, if everyone I work with on this project wasn't around over Christmas and New Year and said, well, sorry, we signed out for Christmas. I don't have, like, we can't operate like that. That's not how my business operates. So they have to have a benefit and derive a benefit from the success of it, but they have to be invested in it, both commercially and personally in terms of they actually have a passion in what they're doing and they see an uplift in what they can earn if they join me in that. So it's not a no to working with other people. I always need other people, but I, I always vet people in terms of what is their, do they align with how I think? Are they happy to go the extra mile? Are they happy to be, although not ideal, contacted at 9 p.m. when there's a problem? Or are they, oh, computer says no, 5 p.m. clocked off, speak to you tomorrow. Because my businesses can't operate like that. Do you trust people when you meet them or do you uh, have to earn trust? Earn trust. My starting point is everyone is a <laughs> expletive, okay? And if you prove otherwise, we'll get on and we'll get on very quickly. And I feel like I've met people in the last couple of years, both commercially and friends, that I can tell, I think, within a very quick period of time, they're almost like someone I felt like I've known for 10 years because you just align. Often self-made, often their own business owner, often with the same mindset, then we click. But I think not trusting people is a skill. And a life skill. And I think if you go in open-minded and trust everyone, if you went online, like you talked about the drop shipping or Forex and you trusted everyone, you wouldn't have a pair of pants around your bum. <laughs> would you? You no. wouldn't have a bank account. And I think th there's too many people trusting or believing a dream because it feels good to look at someone and go, oh, if I click, do you know what it is? It's laziness. I'll, I'll hit the nail on the head. It's laziness for a lot of people. They see something, they think, oh, I can click that button and make millions today. Yeah? <clears throat> Straight away. Because if it was... None of us would be in this van today. Or none of them would be selling the courses to make the millions a year. It's an inception, isn't it? It's madness. But the people that are desperate or don't fancy hard graft or don't like someone like me when I mentor people saying, well, actually, it's time to knuckle down and put in some graft on that. It's going to take some time. They don't want to know that. They want to think, no, but I could just click a button and make millions and be financially free on a beach. But you've got to look a bit deeper. That's not the reality of life. Because you mentioned earlier, and I, uh, property, I actually went on um, a course with a really well-known big property investor, trainer course. And it, I've, I did it out of pure interest. And I was kind of sat there back in the room, just kind of watching and listening. Um, and it was after I'd sold our business. And I thought, you know what, the bet before I actually just go and rush into whatever property means, because like, what is the meaning of yeah, property? Real estate, there, yeah. there, there, there is so many different meanings to it uh, property investing so many different routes so i went on this uh, this day and ultimately the the outcome of it was just to force as many people as possible to spend basic they, they they'd find out how many, much people would 
have in the crowd by going around and saying what deposit levels do you have so that you could afford x they'd find out what money people had to then vet which ones could afford to pay 12 grand to go into a property portfolio course and it, it was the most slickest operation yeah. one of the best salesman i've ever seen i sat back into the room and was absolutely baffled at what i was yeah, kind of yeah, watching yeah. and people just literally just doing it at the end and i was like literally made like over a hundred grand a day yes to just in yeah, courses yeah, because yeah. they vetted the people that are in the room and what they earned before they got there but it often makes people believe that property investing is something that can be done almost risk-free and try and make those little incremental jumps yeah. in interest or hype or yeah. the rest of where i've always done it with a kind of 20-year strategy in mind do you believe that the the best way to get rich is actually the longest way yeah or- i mean so interesting you said that because when i get mentor clients or business consultancy clients a lot of them come to me for property and i'll put my hands up and say i'm not a, i'm not a, i'm not holding myself or purporting to be a property entrep- entrepreneur or mogul what did i do well, I researched the capital growth in the areas of the, that, that I bought in, which was my long-term strategy. Like we said, the 20 years, my pension fund, I didn't have one as a barrister. And does it look more likely than not over a trajectory, over a period of time, given what's happened before, that these will be worth substantially more than I paid for them? Yes. Okay, fine. Also had friends that bought loads of little houses up you know, up north in northern areas for like 10, 12 grand a house and soon realised that a new boiler, even though it's a little bit cheaper up there, for two and a half grand could write off, write off the whole year's rent. <laughs> Yeah, and the capital growth was non-existent. So for me, that wasn't a business model. So that's yes, exactly it, what I'm on about, by the way. Literally. So that. yeah. So th- th- my commercial acumen was involved, and like to think I've got a good commercial compass on me. But did I feel the need to go and pay for a course for someone to teach me the information? No. Have I done and achieved what I want to do with my property? Has it gone the route that I want to do, having put in the, the the research I did? Yes. Do I feel comfortable to advise someone based on my knowledge base? Yes. Because I've got lived experience and I will give them the information that I've used to make the money that I have. Would I go and sell a course on property? No, because that's not the case. And I feel like there's a lot of stuff around, which is just a money making almost pyramid, like you mentioned, where people come to it, think that's the answer and go and do it. But in reality, the only people profiteering are the people running the course. There's so many people out there that will follow you. And if they do, no doubt they'll know that you have a twin brother called TGA. Yeah. Definitely when I was growing up in the early days of four, following you both i'd see you both as a kind of compass as, as together it's like yeah. one, one wouldn't really go without the other yeah, when you're yeah, out yeah. and about over the years has that relationship become different as you both grown up through business like yeah what, how do you both kind of work together now do you, are you both kind of quite separate yeah so tom and my tom and my twin were two minutes apart so we kind of inseparable as kids got to this lived a very similar childhood got to the point of union we're like right he went off to Bristol. I went off to Nottingham. So he did law as well, qualified as a solicitor. So for four years, we separated, if you like. And that was not through bad feeling. It was just kind of like, we're going to live our own lives. So that was the first break, if you like. Then London Muscle, we lived nearer each other. We built that business together. But we've always had our own friendship groups, common interests, own friendship groups. We now don't live that close to each other. Are we close? Yes, we're twin brothers. We've got a bond that's de- very definitely stronger than even just being siblings. Do we see each other a huge amount? No. Do we talk a huge amount? No, not all the time, but we're in touch with each other. Do we have each other's back irrespective of anything that happens in life at the click of a finger? Yes. Are we aligned on things? Yes. Do we support each other? Yes. So we're not online present with each other the whole time because it's like herding cats trying to get our schedules together. We run our consultancy and mentorship business together. People come to us and have one-on-one sessions to work out, you know, whatever it is, their business or their, their investment or whatever it happens to be, or just life life kind of coaching in terms of like how the hell do I get through these periods in my life so and some of them might have more connection with Tom and Tom's journey or me or they look at us like you say as a jewel and think do you know what the twins they've helped me through certain situations we reply to pretty much everyone on Instagram we're very similar but we're very different and that sounds cliche I think it um, would be unfair to get through this without actually mentioning a moment that I had with you probably back in 2020, which is actually when you said you were going through some hellish shit you yeah, yeah. yourself. And I actually saw you advertising online coaching as well and trying to just be someone to talk to. And I, I phoned up and explained what the situation that I was in at the time, try, yeah. trying to get out of a family business. I was in a lot of debt and I, I was just fucked. Like men- yeah, men- yeah, yeah. mentally, I, remember, I just I wasn't there. And what I will say about James sat opposite is... I said, you know, normally I, I pay for everything, whether it's going out for food. Well, I'm, yeah, just, yeah, I'm yeah. just used to paying for stuff. And I said, look, how much do I owe you? I, I really need to sit down and, and, and go through this thing. And mm-hmm. you went, mate, just don't don't stress about it. Yeah, yeah. So just tell me what's yeah, tell yeah. me what's going on. 
And I want to thank you massively because I've been waiting for the opportunity to properly do it because f- from then it was the first little actually moment through that time that someone just went, no, nah, don't worry. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of here from you other than the kind of immediate family. What, what installs that in you? Because for someone that, well, it's hard because I see you trying to make so many money in so yeah, many different yeah, yeah. ways. Where do you find that balance to do the stuff where you walk yeah. into the prisons or to pick up the phone and just help yeah. someone that's been there for a period of time? Ben, I, I think to be honest, that's what, ultimately defines who I am and what I am and what I try and convey online and why why I even launched coaching and mentorship because your example of that property or the example you just gave in terms of your personal life or the situation you were in there's almost I think sometimes it's impossible to go and find the right person someone might shove you to a counsellor if you're in a period of life which is tricky commercially and therefore emotionally affecting you but a counsellor is not the right person quite often because they're going to give you kind of the emotional advice but not the pragmatic advice and half of your brain wants the commercial stuff satisfied because you're not going to be comfortable otherwise and that's what's triggering your emotional side so and then when you look online you're either going to go and put your money in a pot with someone for a 15 grand course hoping it will solve your life problems with desperation you don't know that person they don't know you there's no connection and nexus you probably haven't known them for the last 10 years and so for me it's two things one i genuinely like to help people and as a theme throughout my life i've always done whatever i have to offer i can give back i will and i'll help people and number two i genuinely feel as an individual i've got enough life experience that most people that come into me with a problem I can help them. And if it's not something I know about, like your situation, if I didn't think I could help you with it, and I always would as a friend anyway, but if you were paying me as well, I'm not taking that on unless I genuinely feel I can sit there and talk to you and you finish an hour with me or a block of sessions with me and have achieved something. I'll say it's not for me because not that I don't care, but I can't help you. So I don't feel comfortable from a commercial. Whereas many people just say, oh yeah, I'll come, I'll listen and charge you. So it, it comes that back to being genuine. That's always what I've tried to be, me, myself. And if it's not something that I agree with or that I can help with, I'm not doing it. And what has having a relationship done to you trying to work 90 hour weeks or 70 hour weeks? Because yeah. time management is something people get baffled by. So on many different levels, well, I've got some friends that when they actually spend a little bit of time with me, go, well, what the hell? Are yeah, you? Yeah. you are absolutely yeah. carnage. And then, it's mad because then I'll sit there and I look at someone like Elon Musk. Yeah. I think just like, how, yeah. how the hell does that what work? The, what in the Musk what is, is going go- on? What is, what is going <laughs> what on What in there? the Elon is but, going but on? But again, when you're talking about running multiple businesses, having clients yeah. that you have to spend time with yeah. on one-to-one calls whilst keeping someone satisfied that's coming, how, yeah, how yeah. do you kind of manage to balance all of that? Yeah, interesting. So being in a relationship, I think, do you know what? It's given me balance because although I'm still that guy that's 100 miles an hour, I have boundaries which I respect. And I feel like when you're in a relationship and that person adds value to your life, then it's very much, it. you don't have to choose between them and work. Or you have someone that understands that work isn't just finishing at five. So two things. One, if they understand, I feel like it's important that someone either understands it or lives a similar life so that they respect, although it's not ideal, sometimes there will be conflicts or you will be working later or there will be on a weekend. So if they get that- so you have to stuff. carry the cut crutches. Yeah, or you have to wheel your bird around for four months. Um, but yeah, so they, they have to understand it, have an appreciation for it. Common interest, I think is a massive thing for me. So, you know, my partner, she's, she's into her fitness, she's in the fitness world. So when I do have spare time on a weekend that I see her, it's not a conflict of interest. We both want to go to the gym and train. But if I was with someone that didn't want to, then my small bit of spare time that I have for me, and for her, if we didn't want to do the same thing during that time, I then have to choose between my own satisfaction and keeping the other side of the party, if you like, happy. I don't have to make that choice. So it makes it very easy. So again, I think it's one of those things that A, they have to understand it, not necessarily live that life, but appreciate, respect and understand that life. B, if they've got, if you've got limited amount of spare time, which I would say I've got less spare time than some other people that have nine till fives and, and are luckily able to box that off when they finish work, they finish work. I can't, I always have to have half an eye on it at least. Um, the, the spare time that you do have is doing things either jointly that you both like or there's an agreement that you'll do your own things in a bit of your spare time and only have a very small amount of time together. But ultimately, if your mindsets aren't aligned, again, same with business partners, same as people that work for you, if you don't have the same vision and mindset, it's a recipe for disaster. And I know, I know a lot of people that work busy lives and the other side of their life, the relationship side, weirdly, one of the major things that a lot of people end up talking to me about in my one-to-one coaching because life is holistic you need to look at relationship work health all of it because if one of those is wrong you're not happy most of them end up spending a lot of time outside a stressful business in a stressful relationship 
that then has an impact on the health because they just turn to food and they don't exercise and what have you. So you often find these themes, they all interlink in anyone's life. And anyone says they don't, if you're in a happy relationship, you're more likely to be happy with yourself. You're more likely to invest in your health and you're more likely to be productive at work, right? And if you change any of those variables, a bit like spinning a plate, something is going to get rattled. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to met someone that, that ticks all the boxes for me. Do you look at the gym for yourself as your own pleasure or do you have to build that into the business now? How do you put, you, go, you going to the gym, yeah. do you put that in front of work? Do you put that in front of the businesses that you're working? Very interesting. So I always think to myself, if I can't find 40 minutes just for argument's sake a day, I've lost sight of normality and balance. Even in my busiest periods, gyms are 24 hours a day and I might finish work at two or three o'clock in the morning some days. But if I can't take 40 minutes out of the day for myself, I need to redress the balance because that's not right. Do I see it as work or pleasure? I see it, interestingly, my one-to-one -one clients are accountable to me. I have my own accountability, which is that in order to be the face of a business, I have to put the work in. So I am accountable to myself. How am I going to take that photo six weeks ago or four weeks ago if I don't put the work in? So to me, the gym is a necessity in my life, but it's also work. That is work to me. And most people won't see it like that, but I have to look a certain way for work. And I enjoy it as a mindset thing, keeping me sane and keeping me fit and healthy. But equally, it is, it is work. It's an obligation for me. I can't go through a period of life where I just allow myself not to exercise. And what's the number one thing that you see? Because obviously, the biggest thing that I've, I've learned over a period of time that is almost one of the key skills to make anything work, whether it's business, fitness, anything, is consistency. Yes. But to be consistent at something, you often have to have a strong mindset, and especially yep. when it comes to fitness. Yeah. You know, not choosing the bowl of sugary cereal yep. over yep. the protein bar, etc. Yeah, yeah. With all the clients that you, you have, holistically, what is it that stops people from achieving their goal the most? Some is self-belief. So they just don't think they can do it. They just say, I'm too busy. I can't do it. And then when you say, well, can you not find 30 or 40 minutes, even three times a week, then it's a slightly different conversation. Number two is education. So that example of the cereal versus the protein bar, you can still eat both, not an issue at all, but you have to have some understanding of how it all comes together. There's a number over the course of a day we need to try and hit, as simple as that, calories. And if we're just guessing at it, it's not going to work. And number three is a structure and a program or something that actually you have a game plan, something to follow. If you go in and it's just organized chaos, you don't know what you're doing. It's very easy to not do that the next day because you haven't fallen off a program or a structure. You haven't got a Monday to Friday agenda laid out. Most people with a business or with work, you go into work and your boss tells you to do something. But if you didn't have any structure there, it'd be very easy just to, you don't even need to show up. So once you've got the structure and someone in place and someone that you're accountable to, then it becomes actually easier to be consistent. It doesn't mean you like it, doesn't mean you're motivated every day doesn't mean you need to but as long as you get through that first period and you start to see change both physical and mental that's the then key lifestyle change when you go right do you know what two people have told me i've lost weight two, two people have told me i look better i feel better i can go up that flight of stairs with a bit, being out of breath where i was formerly i'm not now i can kick the ball with my kid okay fine i've gone and got blood tests and now i've got better cholesterol whatever it happens to be that's the pinnacle point where people go okay do you know what this is worth doing. But it's that interim bit where they're getting started and they're getting frustrated because they're seeing themselves in the mirror every single day and you can't see change overnight. That's when people go through that on, off, on, off. And that's where when you've got someone that keeps you accountable, it makes a massive difference. And where are you going? What's next on your journey? I've got massive plans for the fitness side of things this year. Um, massive, massive plans on that front. The rehabilitation side is something that I'll always keep in the background. Seeing the guys that I've worked with now are tutoring courses for London Muscle. So as I speak to you today, I've got a course running up in Waterloo with eight offend or previous ex-offenders being run by the gentleman that I helped rehabilitate as the course tutor who's now qualified. So that self-fulfilling business model where he is now earning a decent wage, a daily wage as a tutor to help other like-minded men on their journey that then creates that never-ending cycle of rehabilitation. Um, and, and that's, I, I love that. I think it's amazing. I really, really enjoy that. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know what's around the corner in terms of other businesses. I've always got ideas, but the coaching and the mentorship is just going from strength to strength and it's massive. The demand's so high, but I want to try and put together something that I see as a strand when I take all of the clients I've worked with, all the people's needs and wants and create a course that has genuine value. And I'm starting to identify trends and themes that I can put into that. But like you were saying with the property course, I don't want to just go and make a generic course that people come through and go, well, 15% of that was applicable to my life, but 75% was a waste.
or 85% was a waste. Do you know what I mean? I want to make sure that if when I build that course and it's something someone can go through, there's loads of touch points with me personally, i.e. throughout that journey, they get one-to-one -one touch points. And the nature of that content is such that it actually empowers and gives them value. Well, I think it's been amazing to hear how you balance your life, how you run multiple different businesses. Some of the bits that may, people may not have known about how you grow up and the makeup of all that to turn you into the person that you are, man, that sat opposite me. Hopefully I can put in the work myself over the next year <laughs> and one day, <laughs> one of these, I will end up looking half as chiseled as that. So, J.E., James, thank you for finally you for me. getting the time and getting down to sit in the podcast fan with me. It's been a pleasure. Which hand? There we there go. go. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate it. Cheers. Smashed it.